Cumbria, a place famous for its lakes and mountains. This is the story of how a beautiful summer's day in a place known for peace became forever linked with tragedy. It was 60 minutes of murder. Body scattered off pavement. Derek Bird killing on average every six minutes. In a few short hours, 12 people died and many more were left fighting for their lives when a mild-mannered taxi driver went on the rampage. Someone came running out the door and shouted, uh, oh, there's a madman running around with a gun. The man responsible was Derek Bird, a 52-year-old father of two. There was a bang and then another bang and it was kind of, was that gunfire? What she said was, don't go, Dad. There's a madman out there with a gun. He picked some victims that he knew. I've known her for 20 years and he just, he'd shot me and I thought, well, why me? And some that he didn't. I crouched down. Next thing I knew, I got the other barrels in the middle of my back. I was just glad when I heard that car drive off. And left many more asking, could it have been me? What if, 20 seconds later, if I was coming that way, if I was doing this? Who was Derek Bird? And why did he set off on his deadly spree? Derek Bird is a real challenge psychologically. It's actually a conscious effort. I am now going to do it. I'm going to get these weapons and I'm going to do it. Could anything be done to prevent it ever happening again? To those people who say you can't legislate against the odd gun owner who goes berserk, I would say you can try. And how will Cumbria deal with being linked with such tragedy? One man losing his mind and, 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 and going doing all this is it, it, not Western Cumbria, it's not us. Wednesday, June the 2nd began as a typical day in Whitehaven, a small port on Cumbria's west coast. In the town, shoppers had begun to appear, children on half-term holiday were hanging round. And on the taxi rank, the drivers were stood chatting. I dropped my wife off at work, as I normally do, she goes to work at nine o'clock. I then proceeded down off the Lauder Street, went into a, a shop where I buy my papers, put my lottery on, then proceeded round to Duke Street taxi rank. I was just sitting there, read the papers, had a drink of juice, and it was just a, a normal day in Whitehaven. I'd left my daughter waiting in the car. Me and Luke had just literally come around the corner. Um, I, we were just going to the hairdressers. Um, we'd come around the corner, Darren was the last car parked on the rank. Um, Darren had just shouted over, you know, I and give us a wave. Darren Rue Castle was a 32-year-old cabbie, a well-known character. I knew Darren well enough to stop and have a crack and a cigarette with him, a coffee and stuff, you know. But, yeah, but it, it was just... I, I've never known anyone say anything bad about Darren. He just seemed a nice lad. Dad in Rowcastle, he had a cigarette and a cup of coffee in his hand. He then uh, was walking towards where he normally stands. I looked up and I saw Derek Bird approach the taxi rank. Shout to Dad and Dad and here I want you. Yeah. Derek Bird was another cabbie. He'd lived all his life in this tight knit community. Derek was Derek to us, he was baby. I thought maybe he was just going to have a crack with him, talk to him about something. We come out the corner, um, walked about 10 yards. Derek Baird then lifts up his shotgun and then he shot Dad in the face. That's when I'd said to Luke, it's all right, don't you know, because we both jumped. But I'd said to Luke, it's just that exhaust on that van backfiring. Then he sort of leaned up like that, went bang again. And then as he did that, he shot his quarter panel out on his Citroen Picasso. I was shouting, no, Derek, why, Derek, why? 
All the time, he never spoke a word to me. He just looked at me and he just had a, it was just a plain look. There was no smiling like he was happy to be doing it or sad or nothing. It, people say the word manic, but it, it, it just looked like baby. That was him. Derek Bird was carrying two guns, a double barrel shotgun and a .22 rifle. I just turned round and I thought, get for cover, and I just dived, literally. I had no direction of which way I was going, I was just going down. And then my back, I realised he'd shot me. I then got down to where Dad and Rowcastle was lying, and I thought I'd apply first aid. And then when I looked at Dad's face, Dad was gone. And then I turned round and looked behind me, and there's Derek Baird uh, just walking towards me with the shotgun. I feel like Clint Eastwood. And then somebody shouted, and then he jumped in his car and he drove off. Horrified onlookers thought the gunman had gone and began dialing 999. Got my son out there, dresses. And I just basically tried to get him round the corner, into the car without seeing down. I told him to get in and get away from the doorways because he was still about. And the police still haven't landed by this point. This had all, all happened within minutes. But Bird drove round the one-way system and returned to have a second shot at Don Reed. Come round and he fired another weapon at me, to which he missed. Yes, again I went down and dived, and then he went, the police turned up, I told the police where he'd gone. They went in pursuit after him. This was the scene that confronted hundreds in the town centre this morning. A body lying covered on the ground. Why this driver was targeted first isn't known, but he was well known. I ran out the shop and I seen the guy that had been shot laying on the road, and then the guy with the gun ran past me. When I turned round and looked at him, it was just Derek, because he's a friend of mine. I've known him for 20 years, and he just, he shot me and I thought, well, why me? I haven't done nothing. What if, 20 seconds later, if I was coming that way, if I was doing this? Teddy Kennedy, that's lying in Newcastle Hospital with his hand gone. He put his hand up, that saved him, but he's lost his hand. Paul Wilson, he was walking down Catherine Street. He shot him, he shot him in the face. Hell, hell had come to Whitehaven, basically. With the sirens wailing, Bird headed toward the village of Egremont, five miles away. Darren Rucastle lay dead. What no one yet realised was that he had claimed the lives of two other people already that day, and he was intent on taking more. And as I came up to the level with the car, I saw a figure at the back looking up the hill. And then he turned round. And I mean, the first thing I noticed was that he was just carrying this really large gun. In Whitehaven, gunshots have been fired and we're getting reports that at least one person has died. They're looking for a man who's got a shaved head and he's driving a silver Citroen Picasso. The police are warning people in Egremont and they're urging people in the area to stay indoors and there is police everywhere. Derek Bird came from the hamlet of Raura. He'd been married with two sons but now lived alone in a small terrace. When not at the cab rank, he enjoyed a drink. An ordinary man who in Whitehaven that morning had left one dead and three other people wounded. His route now took him south towards St. Bees and then across country towards the village of Egremont. There he saw Susan Hughes. At 57, she was a mother of two who devoted her life to caring for her disabled daughter. Cyclist Barry Moss came across her moments later. Suddenly there was a car that was just uh, parked up 
but then as the engine was running. But the, what was strange about it was that the, uh, the driver's side door was wide open. And as I came up to the level with the car, I saw a figure at the back looking up the hill. And then he turned round. And I mean, the first thing I noticed was that he was just carrying this really large gun, big telescopic sight and a barrel, and it looked so long. We stared at each other, but I don't know how long for, you know, it seems longer now than it probably was. He didn't seem angry, he didn't seem anything. You know, it was very expressionless. And then he just shuffled, ran into the car, slammed the door shut and shot off down the hill. Where the car had been, you know, the pavement, there was a body lying on the floor just down the hill. There was two bags of shopping and a handbag there. And I just shouted out, you know, are you okay, love? And I thought, oh God, this is, something's really wrong. Then no matter what, what we tried to do, her breathing just got less and less and less. And, and, and at some point it just stopped. You know, we took a pulse and there was no pulse and it just suddenly hit us then. You know, I mean, oh my God, this one's died. We could hear sirens everywhere and helicopters and all sorts of things, you know, and it was like, oh great, the police are coming. And then all of a sudden, someone came running out the door and shouted, uh, oh, there's a madman running around with a gun. Eyewitnesses have described their terror at coming to terms with Derek Bird and his weapons, a shotgun and a .22 rifle. So what were they like and why did he have them? Mike Yardley is a firearms specialist who gave evidence to the official inquiry into the Dunblane tragedy. This is a .22 rimfire rifle, typically used for vermin control on farms and similar places. It's got a sound moderator, a telescopic sight, it's a bolt action gun and it's cycled like that. The rifle fires a single bullet. This would be capable of shooting at 100 yards and more accurately than a shotgun because it's firing a single bullet whereas the shotgun's firing a cloud of small pellets, what we call a pattern of pellets, typically about 300. Everyone available from Cumbria Police's specialist armed units was deployed to stop Bird, using lethal force if necessary. We are in the middle of a very live and active police operation. Um, it is essentially a manhunt at this stage. Frantic checks were underway to establish whether he'd obtained his weapons legally. Until retirement, this man was responsible for Cumbria's firearms teams. The breaking news was that there's been a shooting, uh, which is unusual in itself in Cumbria. Um, and, 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 you know, th this isn't Leeds, Bradford, Birmingham, London, uh, uh, it's Cumbria. It is only a small constabulary, but that doesn't impact on, on, on the ability to deal with something with this. Size isn't an, an issue with this. It's got a good firearms capability within the force, with some very, very, very committed, highly trained individuals. The police were in pursuit, but they were looking for an everyday man in an everyday car. Except he was intent on murder. And now he was shooting at strangers. The car pulled up beside me and just stopped and shouted out the window, can I see you a minute, mate? He was as calm as anything, you know. As I got, took another step, I seen the gun start to lift up. Well, I knew it was wrong, so I immediately turned my head away. And, well, he fired a shot. It was deafening if it was like a burning sensation across my face. I crouched down, and next thing I knew, I got the other barrels in the middle of my back. Well, that blew me forward, and I was on all fours. It was the worst pain I've ever had. Oh, I was terrified. I was. I was just glad when I heard that car drive off. Les Hunter was wounded, but at least he would survive. Kenneth Fishburne wasn't so fortunate. In another location nearby, one resident said he heard two gunshots at around 11 o'clock. Fishburne crossed the bridge, a silver car pulled over. The driver leant out of the window and fired a gun. The former soldier and security guard was shot dead as he walked into the village for his morning paper. At 
10.57 a.m., another victim, mole catcher Spike Dixon, was killed as he walked along the road. He was in the wrong place at the wrong time. Less than 30 minutes had passed since Bird had opened fire at the taxi rank. At this stage, the police thought there were four dead and six others wounded. But as Bird drove on, an awful discovery was being made. His killing spree hadn't started in Whitehaven. For Derek Bird, June the 2nd had actually begun much earlier. By the time the sun rose, he'd driven from his home in Rowra to Lampla, the village where his twin brother David lived. He knew the door would be unlocked. When he arrived, his brother was asleep. He shot him repeatedly with his rifle. David was a regular. In his latter years of being at school, my father and mother was the godparents, and um, well, as I say, they were just they were grand lads. There was nothing wrong with them. To go and shoot your twin brother first, there's something gone wrong somewhere. I mean, they come in the world together, and they go, they went out the world together same day. The twins' father, before he died, had loaned David £25,000. It was mentioned in the father's will, and Derek thought he was entitled to part of that money. But his twin and the family solicitor, Kevin Commons, had not paid him. And Derek did have money problems, including an unpaid tax bill which he thought might mean a jail sentence. After shooting his brother, he headed toward Frizzington, where Kevin Commons lived. Iris Carruthers was out early that day. It was half past five and I was out with my dogs uh, and I was walking up what's called a tip road and coming from, the, there's a farm where Kevin Commons lives and um, Derek was actually coming from the farm that morning uh, as, and he passed me as I walked down. As I went past him, he, I just said, hiya lad, are you all right? But he just glared and just like a stare. And I just carried on walking, and I, I just happened to look back to see where he actually had gone, and I'd left him stationed at, at the gate, facing the main road as I left. Bird returned home, and reports say calmly washed his car. But at just after 10am, he went back to Kevin Commons' home and shot him dead on the driveway. Then he got back into his car, and set off for the taxi rank in Whitehaven. The first Iris Carruthers heard of the shootings came in a phone call. And my husband told me there'd been a shooting up at Kevin Commons' farm. I, I just couldn't believe it. I said, are you sure you've got it right? And he says, yeah, that's, that's the, the name and it's Birdie that they're after. By 11am, Cumbria police had sealed off David Bird's house and Kevin Commons' farm. David was one of the first victims gunned down. The lawyer was shot dead in the driveway. Just a few miles away, Derek Bird was still at large and still driving. He was shooting randomly at strangers, but also seemingly intent on settling old scores. A keen scuba diver, he'd fallen out with his instructor, Jason Carey. He arrived at Jason's house and banged on the door. Jason was asleep and Bird had left before he could answer it. We are at an early stage of this investigation. We're not able to understand at this stage the real motivation behind it or establish whether this... Professor David Cantor is one of Britain's most experienced psychologists. Derek Bird is a real challenge psychologically to try and get some understanding. It is possible that he looked at his lifestyle, he looked at the way he dealt with the public, perhaps the way the public dealt with him as a taxi driver. He, he wondered about what he'd achieved and eventually it, it reached the, such a mass of, of concerns and frustrations uh, that he felt he had to do uh, something about it. This remarkable video shows Derek Bird on the cab rank in Whitehaven, days before his rampage. He's with Darren Rucastle, 
who Bird would shoot dead on June the 2nd. And to the left is Terry Kennedy, who would also be shot, but would survive having lost his hand. The fact that he presented such a amenable face to the world is possibly one of the clues to all of this, that he was really hiding his feelings, and by hiding them and not discussing them with people, was fermenting an anger and a frustration that he had no way of dealing with. Beneath the smile, Derek Bird was overwhelmed with personal problems. His mother was ill, the Inland Revenue were investigating him, he felt his brother and the family solicitor were cheating him, he thought other drivers were jumping the queue and picking up fares. And a few months earlier, he'd been attacked by youths while at work. He went to get some sort of rifle with a, a sight on it and, and a shotgun. Um, so that is a very conscious effort. It's not like somebody suddenly hitting out at them somebody in the pub because they've insulted him. Um, it's actually a conscious effort. I am now going to do it. I'm going to get these weapons and I'm going to do it. Next, Derek Bird brings terror to a quiet seaside resort. He'd obviously seen the gunman point the gun at him and had gone up defensively like this um, and leaned back, which had probably saved his life. But would anything have stopped him? There's no question that the fewer guns there are in a society, the less gun violence there is. It was just over half an hour since Derek Bird had opened fire at the taxi rank in Whitehaven. Half of his six victims were targeted and half were complete strangers. Overcome with rage, he was now shooting people at random. As he drove off from the village of Wilton, he came across 66-year-old Jennifer Jackson and shot her dead. Moments later, her husband James, who was 65, also died as he chatted at a neighbor's gate. Derek Bird has a number of characteristics within his activities that are typical of spree killers. And they often seem to start off by some personal grudge, some frustration, some anger with a particular group of individuals. Then it spreads out uh, into a larger group beyond that. Behind him, Cumbria police had mobilised every available firearms officer and air support was on its way from neighbouring forces. But relying on detailed knowledge of the local roads, lanes and tracks, Bird was staying one step ahead. From the Scottish border, which is where Cumbria goes up to, right down to the Lancashire border, you've got 100 miles. With a quarter of a million people in such a massive area, there's an awful lot of, 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 of countryside. And the area is a network of little roads, country lanes, um, small tracks that join these country lanes up, all with high hedgerows, uh, and that's before you get into the Lake District. David Moore was in his garden at Seascale, the next community on Derek Bird's route. I was working at home in the garden when I received the phone call that said that there was an incident occurring in Whitehaven and that shots had been fired and they believed that there were actually people had been killed. And I'm trying to get my head around this conversation I'm having on the phone. I'm saying, this is real. You, you, you know, and they said, oh yeah, we don't know exactly what, but we know there's definitely been people shot in, in Whitehaven. And there was a possibility that this had now moved towards Egremont, so it's appearing to be moving this way. It was 20 past 11 as Derek Bird approached Gosforth. He spotted farmer Gary Purdom cutting a hedge. Gary was a well-known rugby player and coach. The two men exchanged words, then Bird shot him dead. I knew, I knew Gary Purdom. He, like really well, just sort of through rugby and he, he coached kids at Egremont, I coached kids at, at Ensingham, you know, I, I do club secretary, so all, all, all the little local clubs, all the coaches all know each other. Um, and then obviously when Gary used to play, would be as well for White even you know, work it and, but it was just the fact that he, he, you know, Gary was just stood trimming edges on his garden and then you know, he's just been killed. It's, it's, it's just just hard to get your sort of head around what's, why he's done it. 
In a curious way, we can understand what he might have been thinking that led him to kill um, his solicitor and people he'd had direct contact with and that he presumably held a grudge against. It's more difficult to understand the people he killed who he had no contact with, who he didn't know at all. People he saw may have triggered some association, some memory, some knowledge uh, of, of previous contact he'd had, or may have just been people who were there and he was going to shoot the next person he saw who, who got in his way. From here on, everyone Bird targeted would be a stranger. On the outskirts of Seascale, estate agent Jamie Clark was forced off the road and shot at. He died of his injuries. Bird's route was now taking him into the centre of Seascale, a small seaside resort. It was 11.30 a.m. Several people have been killed and others injured in a shooting in West Coast. The police are warning people in Seascale not to go outdoors. We'll keep you updated on this story as we find out police more say details. there are a number of crime scenes right across the county. David Moore, a member of Seascale's volunteer fire crew, was still in his garden. I heard a helicopter. Obviously, you know, that attracted me to, to stop and listen. And at that point, I heard two shots. Looking up, I saw it was a police helicopter. So my mind's starting to do a little bit of overtime now. And then the second pair of shots, when I heard them, definitely led me to believe that something sinister was, was happening here. But at that point, actually, my alerter went and I, I was called out to the local fire station. It was half term, and on the seafront, children were playing. Gillian Coolshaw and her family were about to join them. A silver car came up the brew. There was something that made me look at the car um, and think there was something wrong. And as I was walking, there was um, a bang and then another bang. And it was kind of, was that gunfire? It, it can't be gunfire, we're in sea scale. The shots were from Derek Bird's gun. Michael Pike was their target. A retired worker from Sellafield, he was on his morning bike ride. Then, for a moment, Bird seemed to be looking for his next victim. He then stirred over at our group and the piercing black eyes um, staring at us. That was a kind of, is it our turn next type of thing? And it was kind of, he, he just literally drove off and left us. A few yards further on, Bird paused again. He'd spotted Jane Robinson, who was 66 and delivering homeware catalogues to her neighbours. She too was shot dead. Jane is 24-7 in sea scale, um, a well-respected lady, had all the time in the world to talk to the children, very pleasant, very caring, and she will be extremely sadly missed, Jane. You just think, what an absolute waste um, of a life of somebody who's so genuine, so helpful, so pleasant. Because of everything that had happened during that day, that could have been me, that could have been my children. It could well be that he let the family go because children were not part of what it was he was angry with. You're dealing with an individual who, by the time he'd shot two or three people, was in a totally um, overreacting emotional state in which there would be all sorts of triggers and indicators that would be going on in, in his mind. Bird had killed three people in 15 minutes. Every time the police closed in on him, they came across a new murder scene to deal with. The main element of any firearms incident is actually to contain it, if you can. Under these circumstances, how do you contain it when a guy's in a car, shooting from it, driving around the country, he's a taxi driver so he knows the roads better than anybody, and, and to try and contain it, which is obviously what they were trying to do. By now, the police knew exactly which guns Derek Bird was carrying. He had properly registered licences for both of them. Their records showed he'd held a shotgun legally since 1995 
and a rifle since 2007. His background included a minor conviction for theft 20 years ago, but nothing that would prevent him lawfully holding a gun. If there'd have been any inclination whatsoever that a guy has got possession of firearms and is mentally unsound, they'd have been taken off him. Despite the pressures in Bird's life, nothing outwardly suggested he was about to explode into such extreme violence. But critics ask why a taxi driver like Derek Bird needed not one, but two guns in the first place. With 1.8 million legally held weapons in England and Wales, they say it's too easy to get one, and that certificates should be reviewed every year rather than five. There's no question that the fewer guns there are in a society, the less gun violence there is. We want to see the uh, applications being made more frequently and the um, renewals being, having to be done more frequently than five years. Too much can happen in somebody's life in five years. I think building gun laws around one very unusual incident um, could be very misleading. And there's always the risk that you drive guns underground. Um, the if the law becomes any tighter and in many ways it's better to have guns licensed and known where they are and who possesses them. To those people who say that you can't legislate against the, the, the odd gun owner who goes berserk, I would say you can try and you can reduce the risk because there's no doubt that if Derek Bird had not had access to guns, he wouldn't have been able to kill all those people. I was saying that there's no other way that they can go and create mayhem without a gun. A car, a knife, a crossbow, you name it. There's lots and lots of different ways that somebody whose mind goes can still do it. At just after 11.30 a.m., Seascale's part-time fire crew were arriving at the fire station ready to answer an emergency call out to what they thought was a road accident. First thing we do is get our fire kit, our fire kit on, come into here, which is the office. We will then take um, a printout, which comes over, over the machine here, which tells me there's a road traffic collision on the Gosforth Road sea scale. Obviously, as the lads come into the station, there's mixed messages. Others have heard other things on the grapevine about there's incidents going on, there's been shooting. Obviously, that's in your back of your mind. At that time, my daughter pulled into the fire station, and what she said was, don't go, Dad. There's a madman out there with a gun. Not going wasn't, wasn't an option. But the main thing is I want to put my daughter somewhere where she's safe. And I, I couldn't think of anywhere safer than just telling her to come in the fire station, and as we drove out, just lock the doors. The village is full of people, totally stunned. About half a mile from the fire station, which is going into the centre of the village, went under the bridge and obviously we couldn't actually get through because what was there with the door standing open was um, Harry Berger's car. Harry Berger, the landlord of a local pub, had crashed into Bird as he had driven at speed into the town. This video was taken minutes later. As passers-by try to perform first aid on Harry Berger, a police firearms unit arrives and then heads off in pursuit of Bird. Other police then arrive, along with the fire service, and they get to work cutting the stricken driver from the car. He'd obviously seen the gunman point the gun at him and had gone up defensively like this um, and leaned back, which had probably saved his life because he, he took the shot around the arm and shoulder area. So we've got him suffering from severe gunshot wounds. I mean, these were two, two barrels of a, uh, of a 12 bore shotgun at, at almost point blank range. Um, so he did have serious injuries. Harry Berger was cut free from his car and put onto a makeshift stretcher to wait for an air ambulance. He was lucky to survive. Derek Bird's shooting spree wasn't yet at an end. Very soon, walkers and tourists would face lockdown as gunman Derek Bird abandons his car and heads off on foot. 
I was just worried that he was maybe just going to try and go out in a blaze of glory. And with 12 dead and many injured, the people of Cumbria try to come to terms with Derek Bird's rampage. I don't think I've talked to anyone at all that doesn't know somebody that was either wounded or killed. Everybody just seems to know somebody. The man they're looking for, 52-year-old Derek Bird from near Frissington, has travelled south of the county. Cumbria police said they were using every armed force in the county to try to find the man. Sellafield in close. By noon, Derek Bird had shot dead 12 people. He was now heading into the heart of the Lake District, where hundreds of walkers and tourists were enjoying a summer's day. Farmer Ralph Jackson was carrying out an errand for his daughter when he heard sirens. I stopped a man and asked him what was going on. He said that there was a gunman on the rampage. So I set off to come home. Got to the road end, about nine or ten police cars down, down the lane. In the hamlet of Boot, campers were enjoying the sunshine, walkers headed for the hills, and the first visitors had arrived at the two village pubs. We got a phone call from the police saying that the suspect was on his way up the valley. And at that point, he wanted us to take people into the building as a precaution. And we kind of thought, you know, he was it's a good place to escape up there through hard knock pass and things. We thought maybe that's that's where he's going. Time was running out for Bird, but he was still looking for victims. Someone came running into the pub asking for a first aider. And Gareth, that's my son, who is a first aider, went. And the next lady that came in said, this person who needed the first aid had been shot. And that was, that was the moment at which we realised that this guy was here. She was taking a photograph. So the camera was responsible for it not being any worse than it was. She would have the camera in front of her, her face, wouldn't she? But he said, have a nice day. The helicopters were searching, and it did really feel as though they were beginning to, to really concentrate around this specific area. The helicopters weren't doing the wide sweeps anymore. They were just around and around. It was shaking the building. Since leaving sea scale, Bird had shot three people. Remarkably, all were still alive. Driving fast along the tight country lanes, he hit a rock and burst a tyre and was forced to abandon his car. We met a couple of armed response police and they let us know that he actually ditched his car 200 yards up the road and disappeared into the woods. Police say the man they're looking for dumped his car in the boot area. We don't know if he's actually been hurt or killed. It's unbelievable. We made even more of an effort to kind of get everybody in. I was just worried that he was maybe just going to try and go out in a blaze of glory. The car was parked just before the bridge with a side window out and he'd met two people on the bridge when he was carrying his guns. He'd spoken to them, such as, get out of my road, I won't hurt you. And then he'd come over the bridge, turned right, 100 yards down the lane, into the wood. All over. Derek Bird's rampage was at an end. Twelve people, many of them complete strangers, were killed before finally, with the police closing in, he turned the gun on himself. I don't think Derek Bird will have really taken much notice of what was likely to happen to him. The various spree killers I've looked at, I don't think they're ever really concerned about getting stopped. Um, they're on a path that will um, take them eventually. Uh, to getting killed. I mean, in America they talk about suicide by cop, where people deliberately set up a situation where they know they're going to get killed by the police shooting at them. 
Cumbria police say they found the body of a man they believe has gone on a shooting spree. Police say they've seized a gun from the scene and are working to formally identify the man. More than 40 armed police had been deployed to try to stop Bird, but in the wooded lanes and back roads, he'd always stayed one step ahead. It would appear that they've never had the opportunity of actually confronting Bird before he actually took his own life. Um, had they had, they would have dealt with it, I'm sure, in the most professional way uh, that they, they, they trained to do so. You just cannot get your head around this. Why? You keep saying to yourself, why? Why did it happen? If he went to shoot himself, why didn't he go and shoot himself up Blood Valley somewhere, if that was inclined to be? Instead of taking innocent people's lives. He's ruined people's lives. One week after the shootings, the people of Cumbria gathered at services to remember those that had been killed and wounded. In Whitehaven and Egremont and Seascale. We're a small rural village. These things don't happen to us. Or we believe they don't happen to us. Their home somewhere that one of the victims described as paradise was now forever linked with places where similar tragedies had happened. Places like Columbine, Dunblane and Hungerford. Hungerford, where two decades before they'd suffered the same trauma when Michael Ryan shot dead 16 people before turning the gun on himself. Ron Tarry was then the town's mayor. I think in Cumbria, they can, as a community, recover from it, although some individuals will find it difficult or impossible to come to terms with such a dreadful events. The only lesson I think we could learn that we in Hungerford were helped by the fact that we all pulled together. I think that helped. You can do a great deal more as a community than you can as an individual. And I know by the strengths that we have in this community that we will come through this. It will be difficult for some families, but we will work together and as a community the strength that we've shown already will prove that we will come through this and we will come through this stronger than ever. No one will ever know why Derek Bird did what he did, but in this quiet corner of England, his impact will be felt for generations. David Bird, Jamie Clark, Kevin Commons, Isaac Dixon. I don't think I've talked to anyone at all that doesn't know somebody that was either wounded or killed. Everybody just seems to know somebody. Heather Fishburne, Susan Hughes, James Jackson, Jennifer Jackson. One man losing his mind and, 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 and going doing all this is it, it, not Western Cumbria, it's not us. Michael Pike, Gary Bird, Darren Drinkhouse, Jane Robinson. The community of Cumbria will stick together and they will get over it. <laughs> <laughs>